Well, hello, church, and anyone who may be joining us online. My name is Trey Keller, and I serve as a deacon at the Brentwood Church in Brentwood, Tennessee. I want to welcome you to the continuation of our 2020 summer series. Our theme this year is At His Feet, the Parables of Jesus. Uh, we've had a really encouraging study virtually so far this year. We're going to continue in that right now. Uh, this is week 10, and our guest speaker this week is Wilson Adams. Wilson comes to us from the Veterans Parkway Church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Wilson has been a longtime student of God's Word. We're so grateful anytime we have the chance to study with him. And so we're excited to do that now. Thank you for joining us, and uh, let's dig in. Very pleasant good uh, evening to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> it is my pleasure to be a part of your Wednesday night Bible study series this summer. I've done it before at Brentwood and have always enjoyed being, being with you and assembling with you and talking and greeting and several folks there that I really uh, think a lot about and, and love dearly. And so I'm sorry that I can't be there in person this time. And I'm sure that's the same can be said for all of the other speakers who are having to present this way. But I hope it will be uh, encouraging nonetheless, maybe even have others who normally could not attend to be a part of this uh, this study. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate again. I really appreciate that, and thank you for the opportunity. My title that I was given for this particular lesson is out of the 18th chapter of the book of Luke, uh, Persistence and Passion, especially when it comes to the subject of prayer. And we're going to get into the Luke passage in just a few moments, but before we do, I hope you have your Bible with you and turn over to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 31, jumping into the middle of the mountain message of Jesus. In Matthew 6 and verse 31, he admonishes us by saying, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. Jesus says we can spend we can spend all of our time worrying about this and worrying about that and chasing after all of the minor things of life, but he reminds us of something in verse 32. Even non-believers do that. Even people who don't have a relationship with God, who don't even believe in God, they do that. And so he says, let's get our priorities straight. And he concludes in verse 33 by saying, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So here's my question as we start tonight. My question is this. When you think about the way you pray, do you pray big or do you pray small? Do you pray more in line with verse 31? Oh, what are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What are we going to wear? Or do you pray more in line with verse 33? Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Which is it? Now, first of all, I'm not saying that God doesn't care about every part of your life. Please don't take that and run down the road with it. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying God doesn't care about food and clothing and shelter. In fact, earlier in the mountain message, he says, pray for your daily needs. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is this. Sometimes that's all we ever pray about is our food and our clothing and our shelter. Or we'll ask God to oh, help me get past this cold or Lord, help me pass this test in school. Help me get through with school. Help me get a job. Help me get, get a paycheck. Lord, help me find my car keys. Help me have sweet dreams tonight. And on and on and on, amen. Is that as deep as we go when it comes to prayer? Is that it? I wonder sometimes if God doesn't say to his children, do you really want to spend another year coming to me with the same small requests of minutia. This is the God who moves mountains. This is the, the same God to whom we sing, how great thou art. This is our God is an 
awesome God. And then we pray. Lord, I come to you asking for help. Help me to get over this cold. Really? That's as deep as we ever go? And I wonder sometimes if God doesn't ask, isn't there something bigger that you want me to do? So before we, we get into the text, I just have to ask you the question, what are you praying for these days that's big? Are our prayers just concerning the little things? Or are we stretching our faith bigger than maybe we sometimes do? Are our prayers just rote? Or does something grip your heart so much that when you talk about it, you become emotional? When you pray about it, you become emotional. You, in essence, say, God, if you don't, it won't. Maybe it's a... Maybe it's his healing hand upon you physically or a loved one. Maybe it's his help with a marriage. Maybe it's the power of the gospel touch upon somebody who is lost. Maybe it's getting through these difficult days when we've been so divided among so many things. What are you praying for these days that's bigger than you? What are you praying for that is beyond your ability to work out, beyond your know-how, beyond your vision? What are you praying for that takes your faith and stretches it and stretches it and stretches it beyond your capacity? In other words, if the size of your prayer request equate to the size of your God, how big is your God? This isn't about approaching God like he's some kind of Santa Claus. Dear God, I want a, I want a million dollars. <laughs> I want a new car. I want to take the kids on a vacation. That's not what this is about. That's Joel Osteen kind of stuff. That's not what this is. I'm talking about something that when you think about it is intimidating to you. So much so that you're afraid to ask. Because to ask would wrench you out of your comfort zone and literally put your faith to the test. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about how we approach the subject of prayer versus how Jesus approached the subject of prayer. Now then, let's go to our text in Luke chapter 18 and let's see how he approached the subject. In Luke 18, Verse one says, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city and she kept coming to him saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling but afterward, he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice? for his elect who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice to them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith upon the earth? What an interesting story, as they all were. But the whole story that Jesus tells goes back to the very first verse in Luke chapter 18. He was telling them the story. Why? To show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. To be persistent, to not give up. And that's the message that we wanna talk about tonight. Now, the story Jesus tells in Luke 18 comes upon the heels of another situation that occurred back in Luke 11 about prayer 
So take your Bible and go backwards to Luke 11, and let's look at what was said here, because I think what is said in Luke 11 sets the stage for what Jesus taught in Luke 18. In Luke 11 and verse 1, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, would you teach us to pray? And the text says in verse 1, after Jesus had finished praying, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Now, the first thing that I observe about that is that's kind of odd. And the reason I say it's odd is because these were good Jewish men. I mean, these, these men grew up going to the synagogue week after week after week, from the time they were little boys to the time that they are now grown. They have heard public prayers over and over and over again. They've no doubt been praying themselves since they were little. And now in the company of Jesus, they've been watching him pray. And they notice something. He prays different than we pray. It's like, we pray. And he prays. I mean, it is totally different. And so they're watching Jesus pray, and they say to him, Lord, teach us to pray. We want to pray like you pray. And so he does, beginning in verse 2. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And where's the rest of it? Boy, Luke left a lot of stuff out. You know, at this point in a study, usually we'll flip back to Matthew chapter 6 and, and, and give the fuller version of the Lord's Prayer. Well, first of all, it's not the Lord's Prayer. They have come to him asking him, Lord, teach us to pray. So it's not the Lord's Prayer. He's helping them learn to pray. And secondly, it's not the Lord's Prayer because Luke doesn't even repeat it here word for word. But that's the whole point of prayer anyway. The point of prayer is not repetition. The point of prayer is not memorization of something. Sometimes parents teach their children when they're little, little and small, you know, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take, that, that kind of thing. You ever think about the words of that prayer? You just put your kid to bed and told him, well, you, you know, you may not live through the night, but this is a good thing to say. <laughs> really? <laughs> or God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. And so we just kind of do this mem memorized spiel. I remember we, we try to teach our kids to pray from the heart. And I remember on one occasion, our son, Dale, uh, I think Dale was probably 15 about this period of time. And so uh, he was a young Christian. And so we had a Sunday night where another brother brought a lesson and it was his first time. And I think Dale had the closing prayer. And so uh, Dale gets up at the end of the service and he says, uh, praying from the heart, he says, Lord, we know Jason isn't a preacher but he did the best he could do. <laughs> and it's one of those moments, you ever have a parent moment where part of you wants to strangle your kid and part of you just wants to hug his neck? It was one of those kinds of moments, but he was praying from the heart. And that's what Jesus is trying to get over to his men. And he says, okay, listen, you wanna talk about the basics of prayer. You wanna talk about the ABCs of prayer. Thank God for his blessings. Confess the greatness of God. Confess the fact that you're dependent upon him. That's it. Those are the ABCs of prayer. That's like prayer 101. But they already knew that. And so when they came to Jesus and they said, Lord, would you teach us how to pray? That's not what they're talking about. And so beginning in verse 5 of Luke 11, Jesus says, okay, now I want to teach you how to pray. I want to teach you about prayer. And he launches into a story. And this story was, suppose one of you has a friend. I'm in Luke 11 and verse 5. Suppose one of you have a friend and, you, and, and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves. 
for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. So Jesus paints this picture in the story. It's midnight. Now get that clear in your mind. It is midnight and there comes a banging on the door and an audacious request, ridiculous request in our mind. Now back then, it wasn't like our homes in which everybody has a bedroom and everybody has privacy. Back then there was one big room and it was a room in which everybody slept. So it's not like this man can get up in the middle of the night, wander over into the kitchen and get the neighbor what he needed without waking everybody up. Back then when it was bedtime, it was all in. Either everybody's all asleep or everybody's all awake. There wasn't a lot of in-between. And so as Jesus tells the story, this neighbor's knocking on the door. Get up, get up. I need bread, I need bread. I've had company come, get up. And what response does he get? Verse seven. From inside, he answers and says, do not bother me. That's what it says, verse seven. Do not bother me. The door has already been shut and my children and I are in bed. You know that literally says the children are in bed with me. I cannot get up and give you anything. What are you trying to do? You're trying to wake up the whole house? If I get up, everybody gets up. Go away. Now the disciples have heard enough Jesus stories to know a couple of things. Number one, somebody in the story usually represents us, and somebody in the story usually represents God. So who's who? Well, in the story, the person banging on the door and asking, well, that would be us. That's pretty clear. And in the story, the person who represents God hmm, seems to be the man who is asleep and doesn't want to be bothered. Now, honestly, haven't you sometimes felt that way about God? That in your coming to him, in your praying to him, that maybe you're bothering him? Or maybe you prayed about something and nothing happened. And you just go, God's not listening. God doesn't care. God is asleep to my needs. But look at verse eight, Luke eleven eight. 8. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, Yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. You know, the only reason, the only reason for the man to receive his request was the fact that he had the audacity to ask. And the Greek word persistence could be translated boldness or shameless, shameless, bold persistence. One thing was obvious, this man was not going away. He, he's coming midnight. I know you're in there. I know you're in there. Now you can look at the story and think, oh, that's inappropriate. The whole thing is inappropriate. And yet, at the end of the story, the man gets out of bed, stumbles through the dark, finds some bread, opens the door, hands it to his neighbor. All the while, the disciples are kind of scratching their heads and they're thinking, you mean God's like that? Jesus said, you're the ones who came to me and asked me about prayer. I'm telling you about prayer. Now, in the text of our study tonight in Luke 18 that we read, it's the same thing. In this particular story, it's the same, it's the, it's the same point. This widow keeps coming before this unrighteous judge and she keeps asking and asking and asking, pleading, 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 nagging, nagging, nagging. Finally, the judge gives her what she wants. Why? Because she's not going away. And that's the whole point about prayer. If you go back to verse one of Luke 18, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times, they ought to pray and not lose heart. This is all about persistence. This is all about persistence. Is that not what we're talking about? Persistence and passion when it comes to prayer. Don't give up. Don't give up. Now, if you take both, uh, both of these stories and you put them side by side, 
on the surface, it looks like Jesus presents God in the first story as somebody who's asleep and doesn't really want to be bothered. And in the second story, here's a judge who is harassed by a widow to the point that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And we look at these two stories and we say, what in the world? You mean God is like that? And this is where, how do I say this? This is where parable interpretation breaks down because we want, a, we want a parable to be put together like a jigsaw puzzle where every piece fits perfectly. And that's not what this is. The point of both of these stories is not so much on the correct representation of God. That's not the point of the story. The point of the stories, well, it's us. The real focus of both stories is us. It's how it's how we approach prayer. And Jesus approached prayer quite differently, didn't he? When we talk about prayer, we talk about polite prayer, tame prayer. Okay, boys and girls, let's fold our hands and bow our heads and let's pray. When Jesus talks about prayer, he launches into stories about begging and pleading and asking and interrupting and going on and on. So what gives? Well, back in Luke 11 and verse 9, he sums it all up. He says, I say unto you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Three words describe this persistence. Ask, seek, knock. It's not one and done. You don't pray one time and go, well, I guess God's not going to give it to me. I guess God's not listening. He says, you keep asking, you keep seeking, you keep knocking. I remember as a teenager, I remember as a teenager, the elders, were, I think we're having a meeting of some kind, and the elders said, no, let's get all the teenagers together. We had a large group, we had about 30. Let's get all the teenagers together on Saturday morning, we'll divide them all up, send them out through the neighborhood and let them pass out meeting flyers. That'll be good for them, and it'll be a way we can connect with the community. So we all showed up, we paired up in groups, two by two, and we went out, we, and, and my friend Jeff and I, we had our we had our flyers, and so we parked at the end of the street, and he said, well, I'll take this side, and I said, I'll take that side, and so here we go. But I gotta tell you something, my heart wasn't in that. And so I went up to the first house, and I've got this meeting flyer, and I went up to the first house, and I knocked on the door, and here's how I knocked on the door. Nobody's home. And I took a flyer and I stuck it in the door and I went to the next house and I just barely knocked and nobody answered. And so I stuck a flyer in the door. I didn't knock loud enough to wake up anybody's dog. <laughs> and I went all the way down the street the same way. I never had to talk to anybody. And sometimes in our prayer, in the way we pray, we're kind of like that. We're so meek and quiet and uh, you know, we, we, maybe we don't want to wake God up. <laughs> well, first of all, God's not asleep. And second of all, he says, when you pray, you come and bang on the door. You come and knock on the door. You pray big and you pray bold. I'll tell you what you do. You go back through scripture and you start reading the prayers of scripture. The people who came after God. Look at Abraham and Moses. Think about Hannah. And David and Esther and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Paul, big, bold prayers. They came before the throne and they said, God, you cannot ignore me. You have to do this. You promised. And the message of these two stories that Jesus tells is God loves it when we do that. He loves it when his people pray big and bold in our persistence. It's like God says, finally. Finally, someone has asked me to do something worthy of my name. You know, big and bold prayers were the hallmark of biblical prayers. The, the people in scripture didn't stop praying because God didn't just immediately at that moment open the door. They didn't stop praying because God didn't just immediately at that moment give them justice, or they didn't stop praying because God didn't just immediately give them what they needed. 
the point of Jesus in the two stories. God is not annoyed by that kind of prayer. He's honored by that kind of prayer because that's the kind of prayer that he loves to answer. So let's look at verse 10 as we begin to wrap up our thoughts. He says, for everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds and to him who knocks, it will be opened. He's not saying if you if you pray it on Sunday, it's going to be in the mailbox on Monday. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is you have to, you may have to pray for a month of Sundays. You may have to pray for a year of Sundays, but you keep asking and you keep praying because that's the whole point of the of the stories. Remember the story of the widow, 18.1, Luke 18.1? He was telling them a parable to show at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Why? Because everyone who asks and seeks and knocks and asks and seeks and knocks and asks and seeks and knocks, they receive, they find. It, it, the door is open. Now, I understand, and we could take the next 10 minutes, we're not going to, but we could take the next 10 minutes and remind everybody that we need to pray thy will be done and that our prayer is always subservient to, to God's will. We get that, Matthew 26, 39, uh, Jesus in the garden, thy will be done, or James 4 and verse 15, you ought to pray if the Lord wills, we'll do this or that. So we all understand that. We, we get that. We understand sometimes God says yes, sometimes God says wait, sometimes God says not now. God, God can answer prayer as he wishes because he knows what's best for us. Sometimes we don't. But that's not the point of these two stories. The point of these two stories is, are we just praying, you know, politely? Or are we praying boldly? Are we praying little? Or are we praying big? No wonder so little happens in our lives. It's like Jesus is saying, you do not have because you do not ask and ask and ask and ask. In fact, that's what James said. No wonder so little happens in our churches. You do not have because you do not ask and ask and ask and ask. When I was growing up, I heard brethren, good men, get up and pray. This is in the 60s and they're praying, Lord, bring down that iron curtain. And, and we want the gospel to have free course in, in, in the world of communism. Bring down that wall. And you tell me what happened. Did it happen because Ronald Reagan stood there in Berlin and said, tear down this wall? Is that why it happened? I'm not saying God didn't use him. I'm saying brethren have been praying. Good people have been praying for that for a long time. And it finally happened. And today there's churches in Moldova. There's churches in Romania. There's churches in Ukraine. There's churches in Bulgaria. I've been to Bulgaria. I've preached there. And to be with those brethren and to realize that just not long ago, they had to meet in secret. But I think the fact that walls have been torn down and, and borders have been opened to the gospel is not an accident. I happen to believe in the power of prayer. And I'll tell you something even more powerful than that story. Some of you, some of you are walking with God today because at some point in your life, a mom or dad, a sibling, a child, a friend kept asking and asking and asking. You were out in the far city. You were like the prodigal son. And if anybody tried to talk to you back then, you would have gotten mad, you'd have gotten upset. But in the meantime, they kept praying. Something happened in your life that got your attention. Maybe you had a prodigal moment and you came home. Some have been on the giving end of that prayer. Some have been on the receiving end of that prayer. But that's the message of Jesus. Bold, persistent praying. Asking for something big means asking for something out of our control. It's as if God says, now I know you are really serious about prayer. Now I know you're passionate about this. This isn't about praying that, oh, dear God, we're going to have a family picnic on Saturday. Please don't let it rain. This is the God who made the heavens and the earth. This is the God who has recreated us through the sacrifice of his son. This is the great I am. 
and he listens to his people pray about such little things? Lord, teach us to pray. Pray at all times and don't lose heart. Jesus is kicking us out of our comfort zone. It says, he's asking us the question, you willing to knock on heaven's door and, and really tell God what's in your heart? And we say, well, what if God doesn't answer? Well, what does Jesus say? Knock once and leave? Is that what he says? Someone says, well, you don't know the size of my burden. No, I don't, but you don't know the size of your God. Remember the spies, 10 of them said, you wouldn't believe the size of the giants in the land. And Joshua and Caleb said, get your eyes off the giants, get your eyes on God. There's always gonna be giants in the land. There's always gonna be Goliath's in our path. There's always gonna be a Jericho wall we're up against. I think about Joshua and the army of Israel and they're, they're marching around those walls. They marched all the way around one time. What happened? Nothing. And they marched all the way around the second time. What happened? nothing. And they go around the third and the fourth and the fifth time. What happened? Not a thing. And they go around the sixth time and the seventh and the eighth and the ninth and the tenth. And what happened? Not one thing. And they go around the eleventh and the twelfth. And what happened? Nothing. And they walked around the thirteenth time. And you know what happened? The walls fell down flat. 13 times. I wonder how many of us would have gone around those walls three or four times, maybe, and nothing happened. And we say, well, fooey on this. God's not listening. God doesn't care. I'll give up. 13 times. That's the message of these two stories. You see, one of the ways we honor God is by the size of our request and the heart that we bring before the throne and the fact that we don't stop coming. He loves it when his people pray big and refuse to go away. We sing about the greatness of God. We read about the greatness of God. And then we pray about that big. So I ask you the question, do you believe that all things are possible with God? If you believe that, then why are you praying small? <laughs> Pray big. Pray in a way that is worthy of the greatness of God. I want to close in Ephesians, the third chapter. In Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20 and verse 21, the Apostle Paul said this, Now to him who is able to do far more or exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. What a powerful reminder that our God works in our lives today, just like he has always worked. We have to have faith. And I'll tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> it is so easy for our fears, especially in this climate, it is so easy for our fears to take over our faith. We talk about flattening the curve. We need to flatten the curve of fear. And we need to be people of faith who aren't afraid to pray with the understanding of the point Jesus is making in these two very simple stories. It's been said that the early church prayed jail doors off their hinges and an empire off its foundation. God moves when his people pray. So let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that you provide for us to open up your word and to study. We're thankful, Father, for the privilege that we have of, of doing so. And we pray, Father, during this very troublesome time in which we live, that we can put our trust and our confidence, not in man, but we put our trust and our confidence in you. And Father, we pray that you will help us as your children to let our light shine and to spread the salt in this world 
There are so many people struggling with depression and struggling with anxiety and struggling with uneasiness during this period of crisis. Help us to respond and to meet their needs and help all of us to remind them of what Scripture says and the hope that we have and help us to show by our lives and by our example that we trust in you. We pray, Father, that you will take away this crisis. We pray that you will bring us through. We pray that you will help to solve the racial unrest in our country. We pray that you will ignite the faith in your people that we need to have. Help us to learn from the stories of Scripture that were written to give us hope and encouragement. And we pray, Father, that someone has been encouraged this very night. Thank you, Father, for everything, and thank you for your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Once again, I miss being with you personally, but uh, I'm thankful for technology, and so uh, we've hopefully had a good study, and I look forward to the next opportunity that I can be with you, and uh, thank you again for inviting me to participate. I wish you all the very best. Stay in touch. God bless, and good night. Well, it's been a good thing to be able to go through this study, even virtually. I want to thank Wilson for leading us in that, and uh, you know, we're in a time of distancing, of unrest, of just general kind of chaos and divide around the world, it seems. Uh, to, so to stop and to consider the Word of God and who we are as his people, to be able to approach him in prayer and how to pray uh, has been an awesome thing. I hope you've been encouraged by that as well. My prayer personally is that you have been, that uh, like I will, that you will pursue him even more deeply. And uh, and if there's anything we can do to help with that, we would love to. Please come look at our website at brentwoodchurch.com. You can find a lot more about our summer series. All the links to the other lessons will be there on the parables this summer. Uh, you can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube channel. All those things are there as well and follow along. But but also you can reach out to us and, and, and get contact with us directly through our website. We'd love to connect with you and to pray with you and to study with you. So feel free to do that. Uh, we would be encouraged to hear from you. Um, thank you for joining us in this. Um, next week, our speaker will be Ben Hall from Brooklyn, New York. We're excited to have Ben join us. Again, he's joined us in the past, and uh, he's a great student of God's Word. So we look forward to that study with him as well. I want to read the passage that Wilson focused around one more time, Luke chapter 18 and verse 1. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. May God bless you as you pursue that and as you pursue him this week. Thank you so much for joining us.